This program airs statewide on California Public Television and is a California's Gold Classic. This series is endorsed by the California Teachers Association, the California School Boards Association, and the California Library Association. Hi, I'm Huell Hauser, and right now we're cruising on the Island Queen, which is a riverboat based in Stockton, California. Now we're cruising down the San Joaquin Deepwater Channel, which is the oldest inland deep water channel anywhere in the country. In fact, it was started back in the 1920s. My new friends who are coming along with us on this little cruise, well, they've also been around for a while. They're some of the members of the Stockton Corral, which has been performing for audiences all over the world for over 40 years now. In fact, they just returned from a performance at Carnegie Hall in New York. The members of this corral are part of the fabric of this community. They're part of its history, one of its traditions. And that's what this entire program is all about, California traditions. We're going to travel around this state looking for some of those traditions, and you're invited to come along on this adventure as we travel up and down the state in search of California's gold. California, here I It's Sunday afternoon at Billy Hebert Field in Stockton, and the hometown team, the Stockton Ports, are playing the visiting team from Reno. Not many people in the stands, but then it's an afternoon game and the temperature is 100 degrees. This is the California League, Class A, and the Ports take this game seriously. You see, over the past 12 years, they've been the winningest minor league baseball team in the entire country. But that's not all, because here in Stockton, their baseball team is famous for another reason. Now, baseball has always been a popular sport in Stockton. In fact, they've had professional teams here for well over 100 years. And here's where the fun begins. Back in the 1880s, during the era of hydraulic mining in the gold country, the river in Stockton was especially muddy. In fact, many a riverboat captain referred to Stockton and its muddy river as Mudville. In 1887, a sports reporter from the San Francisco Examiner by the name of Ernest Thayer visited Mudville to watch a baseball game. And he was so inspired by that game that he wrote a poem about it, a poem which was first published in the Examiner a year later and became an instant hit. A poem all about a player on the Mudville team who went to bat and struck out. Probably the most famous and well-known baseball player in the history of the game, Mighty Casey. And the poem? Well, by now you know I'm talking about Casey at the Bat, one of the most often recited poems of all time. And what does all this have to do with the Stockton Ports? Well, look closely at their uniforms, because the Stockton Ports lay claim to being the original Mudville Nine. And every season for their Sunday home games, instead of their regular Ports uniforms, they wear Mudville uniforms. Well, when we first came in here, we were a little bit skeptical about the whole idea. But we What do you mean skeptical? Well, we, we, we saw the uniforms and they looked a little bit hot and they looked a little bit heavy and we weren't real sure we could perform as well as we thought we could in them, but as soon as we got them on, we just felt like we were the, the old timers. We started rubbing a little dirt on our face and we were <laughs> really starting to have a good time with it. This is the original team. This is the original field, supposedly, from what everybody heard or everybody, you know, everybody knows. Were you familiar with the poem? Oh, yeah. I mean, it's something in grade school and stuff. As a matter of fact, we were speaking to a group of kids here in Stockton and that's one of the things they did for English class was that poem. Now, can you get into the Casey thing? Can you give us the way that maybe 
Yeah, well, you I've think? seen a couple tapes on him, and uh, he seems to kind of curl his arms out like this. Uh-huh. Kind of stand there. Like that, squats down a little bit. <laughs> Got to torque the hat a little bit. Look a little bit mean here. And then the ball's coming in. Of course, Casey wasn't known for that hit here. So you just kind of pull off the ball like that. And boom, right by him. <laughs> Strike three. Back to the dugout. It's a lot of fun for the guys, but the only problem with it is these uniforms can be some, they can be hot. And, yeah, they're made know, out of wool, they, right? Yeah, they're made out of wool, and uh, the legs on part of them aren't bad, but the upper body with the collar, the guys aren't used to it. And, but now, and isn't this what the, the ball players really used to wear? Yeah, used to wear. I, I don't know how they did it, but, uh, you know, we'd just soon see them take the collar <laughs> off these shirts, but... Uh, yeah, we have a lot of fun with it. Now, your uniform doesn't, is this the way they're supposed to fit? Well, actually, I wear 32s, but on Sundays, I break out the 38s. Uh-huh. As you can see, they're a little bit, little bit baggy here. Uh, is this part of the tradition? Oh, yeah. Well, those old-timers had those big baggy uniforms. I'm getting into it, you know? <laughs> Anybody can wear pants that fit them. You know what I'm saying, Spark? Now, every once in a while, somebody will raise the question of whether Casey actually ever existed, or was he just made up for the poem? And, of course, several other cities besides Stockton also claim to be the original Mudville. All this makes for an interesting debate for some people, but as far as the Stockton fans are concerned, there is no debate. Now, what do you think about this Casey at the Bat Mudville thing? Did it happen here or not? Well, it certainly did happen here. At, at, you got to have a little, uh, uh, what do you call it? Faith. Faith, right. <laughs> you got to have faith. The story surfaces every once in a while, and there seems to be some basis of fact for a foundation for it. Well, if it's not exactly fact, it sounds good, doesn't it? Yeah, it sounds <laughs> great. <laughs> I've heard nothing but this is where it's at and I really believe it I, I have a feeling that this is where it was what do you mean you have a feeling just I have a feeling this is it I go to a different I've been to the, the uh, San Jose ballpark and I no feeling there I feel that this is where it's happened this kind of has a Casey feeling right. to it exactly 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 and it makes it makes us feel it too and I just think it happened here now do you think any of the players when they're up you know, at plate, and they've got two strikes. And do you think the poem ever comes into play in their mind? I sure hope not, because they won't do too much at the plate if they let that poem go in their mind. But, yeah, he uh, struck out. He struck out, so we've had enough of those this year. <laughs> <laughs> Now, Casey at the bat, did it take place here in Stockton? Yes, it did. Yes, it did. There are other cities around the country that try and lay claim to fame uh, <laughs> as being the city of Mudville, but Stockton has some strong pieces of evidence, uh, so we, we like to lay that claim as well. What are the, what are the pieces of evidence? Quickly here. N number one, uh, the fact that this town was nicknamed Mudville in the late 1800s because of the, a place where the team played was a very muddy area off the Delta. Secondly, uh, there was three players on the team named Flynn, Blake, and Cooney that played for that Stockton team. Those names all appeared in the poem, Casey at the Bat. Now, the poem was written when this fellow was visiting Stockton as well, wasn't it? Or near that time? That's correct. Ernest Thayer wrote the poem uh, for the San Francisco Examiner, uh, Randolph Hearst, the publisher, who was doing it for his friend, Randolph Hearst. And uh, he came out to Stockton to, uh, to write the poem, and he did his little uh, bit on Casey when he was here. So that, it, it seems to me like it's hands down, this is it. Without a doubt. Again, uh, Ernest there was known to have come to a lot of games uh, for the Stockton team in the late 1800s. With all those good pieces of evidence, it doesn't <laughs> seem like just a coincidence. You know, it's been over a hundred years since Ernest Thayer's famous poem first appeared in the San Francisco Examiner. And since then, countless other Casey sequels have been published by lesser-known writers. There's Casey at the Plate, Casey on the Mound, Cool Casey at the Bat, Casey on a Bat, Mrs. Casey at the Bat, Casey's Son, Casey's Sister at the Bat, Casey's Daughter at the Bat, Casey's Revenge, and let's don't forget, Casey at the Bank. But none of these can touch the original, a poem which has become an American classic, a poem the players and fans in Stockton are sure was written about one of their own. The sneer is gone from Casey's lips, his teeth are clenched in hate. 
He pounds with cruel violence his bat upon the plate. And now the pitcher holds the ball, and now he lets it go. And now the air is shattered by the force of Casey's blow. Oh, somewhere in this favored land the sun is shining bright. The band is playing somewhere, and somewhere hearts are light. And somewhere men are laughing, and somewhere children shout. But there is no joy in Mudville. Mighty Casey has struck out. It's Sunday afternoon in San Francisco's famous Golden Gate Park, and we're lucky enough to be listening in on one of the city's true traditions. This is the Golden Gate Park Band, which began regular concerts back in 1882. And when I say regular concerts, that's an understatement, because this proud band holds the distinction of being the oldest and the only year-round municipal park band still performing in the entire United States. It's truly the last of its kind. And every Sunday afternoon in the band concourse area of the park, locals and tourists alike are treated to a free concert. Now the band director is Bob Hansen, who joined up in 1946. In fact, most of the band are longtime members. It's obviously a labor of love. And the atmosphere at these weekly concerts? Well, it's definitely relaxed and low key. It has a small town, old timey feel to it, like something from a different era, from a different time. And that's exactly the way the fans and the musicians like it. Now, what are you all, jogging and just stopping for a little cultural That's enrichment? Right. That's, That's right. right. You know, we, uh, we've heard this kind of band in other countries many times, in like Oaxaca, Mexico, and places like that. Uh -huh. And we'd forgotten that there was such a thing in the United States. Uh -huh. So this is a great discovery. Well, now, this is part of the San Francisco tradition here. This is. Well, That's I thought true. it was dead. I thought it died years ago. I thought budgets killed it. But I'm glad to see it's still here. And I have a baby four months. And next Sunday, I'm going to bring my baby out to sit <laughs> in the front row. Really? Yeah. How many other cities in this country can you go and listen to good classical music for free in a beautiful park? So the band really is good. Oh yeah, very good, very good, and and fun, and it's free, and it's wonderful, and it's San Francisco, it's great. <laughs> Now, how long have you been with this band? 35 years. 35 years? Yes. About 16 years. 16 years. Believe it or not. Now, what is it about this band that makes it so special, that keeps people coming back, the musicians coming back, week after week, year after year? Well, it's a steady job, for one thing. <laughs> <laughs> but other than that, it's good music, and it's a good public service for a lot of people that uh, it's, it's something that for the park itself and the whole city tradition, it's something that's still going on after over 100 years. 18 years. 18 years, yes, and I enjoy it very much. Look forward to coming out here every Sunday. Now here's a bass trombone player who's been with the band how many years? Oh, let's see, it's been about two months now. Oh, so you're the newcomer I'm here. I'm the new guy on the, on the band. Now what are the rules when you're a newcomer? Oh, well, you have to pretty much uh, listen to the old fogies, <laughs> like like this guy. <laughs> Are you an old fogey? 36 years. Really? Yeah. <laughs> 30, Gosh. And it's uh, fun every Sunday. I would miss it. If we ever folded up, I wouldn't know what I'd do for Sunday. Well, now, how do you keep topping yourself every Sunday? I enjoy music, and I enjoy playing this kind of music, and there's no place hardly in the world anymore you can do this or hear it. 
Uh -huh. And I got married a few years ago. I told my wife, I said, I play in a band on Sunday, so forget it if you want to go anywhere on Sunday. That's it. <laughs> Now, how important is it for people to stay in this band? Well, as one of my friends remarked a couple of weeks ago uh, to a member of the audience who asked a similar question, they usually go out feet first. <laughs> and a good example of that is uh, we had a man retire this spring who uh, first played with the band on Memorial Day 1926, and he told me uh, at one point this spring that he was going to have to retire, that he'd been lying to me. He wasn't 87, he was really 90. Why has this band survived when so many others are, are no longer around? There's two real reasons for it. One is it's possibly the only city in the world where the climate is beneficial enough so that you can not only play outdoors in the daytime in the summer, but you can do it all winter long as well because the temperature changes very little. The only time that we're slowed down is when it rains. But the other reason is that it's because it's San Francisco and the people here like good things. It's supposedly the city that knows how and this is one of the things that tells you that. Do you feel personally like you're carrying on a tradition oh, here? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. I mean, every Sunday when you step up there, do you... I'm just one of the players passing through this on the stage, you know. It'll go on long after I'm gone. And it went on long before I was here. It's a tradition that is deeply rooted in the history and culture of Mexico, a sport with a long and colorful history that's been transported now into California. It's called Cheruria, and it's a competition of skilled horsemen, kind of like the American rodeo, but much older and much more formal, more structured. For example, there are nine events in each Cheruria. Each one of these events requiring particular skills, dexterity, balance, courage, and knowledge. The horsemen themselves are called charros and are highly respected. And these days, all over our state, in small local arenas like this one in Ontario in San Bernardino County, it's possible to see this grand tradition being carried on. We have the best horses. We train them. It's not an easy work. We take it two years to train horse to do the things we do it. This horse is a trained horse. It's a real trained horse. It's only five years old, and he behaves because he, he knows I'm the boss. He knows every single event every, too, doesn't he? No, I mean, he knows what to do. He knows every event of the charreria. As you see in, in this uh, in this uh, performance, we have a lot of kids. You know, we have the grandfather, the son, the the yeah, grandson. Yeah, I've seen a lot of three okay. and even four generations. Right. Four generations. And it's, it's something, you know, we are uh, uh, encouraged to do it more and more. That way, we are, uh, our tradition is keep, go keep alive. Now, one of the ways the Chararia tradition is being kept alive is by starting the kids out early, real early. In fact, at this particular arena in Ontario, there's a school every Saturday morning where they're carefully and patiently taught all the skills they'll need to become full-fledged charros. Not all the kids, they like to ride. So whoever doesn't like to ride, we don't force them. Uh -huh. So we're just putting the kids and the, and the bulls. We, we pick the, the bulls like this one, the little steers. They, they don't really buck. They, they give them confidence. They know how to handle it. Uh -huh. So when they get off, they feel like I'm a charro now. 
<laughs> now the idea is to start out slowly and work your way up, and it was a lot of fun to watch. For example, for a youngster, being able to stay on this little calf builds confidence. And this friendly old bull patiently stood around and allowed himself to be roped by kids who needed the practice. All of this greatly appreciated, of course, by the parents who were very proud of their young charros. Now, what do you think about these kids out here? Well, they're enjoying it, and they're learning the way how to do the things here in the, uh, all the events in the, uh, the charreria. Just the way it's supposed to be learned. Now, so is this the key to it that you learn it when you're when you're small? Well, the smaller you learn it, the better. That way, as long as you're growing up, uh, you just don't think of doing it. You just do it automatically. It comes naturally. Right. Now, when did you start? Well, I started pretty old, about 19, 18 years old. Oh, you're you you waited too late. I know. Me parece muy bien. Me gusta mucho. She likes it a lot. I think your daughter likes it a lot too. Maybe she should be out there. Yeah, she was telling me she wants a, a, a hat, <laughs> sombrero. <laughs> yeah, she likes that too. <laughs> you gonna be a charro when you grow up? No, a charra. 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 Charro, I mean. She's teaching me how to pronounce it. I can't do it right. She's from uh, San Fernando Valley. I'm going to be a charra. I'm going to be a charra. Charra from San Fernando. Well, you know, in a way, it's kind of old-fashioned, though, isn't it? Yeah, it is very old-fashioned, but we're trying to keep it up, trying to keep it up and up and up. Is it hard to keep the kids' interest in something as old-fashioned as this? Sometimes it is. Sometimes you got to, like, come on, don't stop, don't stop. But there's some times where they catch on, and then they start to enjoy it very much, and then they're just doing it by themselves. Yeah. You just got to give them a little bit of support. Come on, kid, let's go, let's go, let's go. Sometimes he gets a little bit lazy and wants to jump on a skateboard and this and okay, there's time now for Now wait everything. a minute, you mean you'd rather ride a skateboard than work with your rope there? Well, well I work with my rope, then I do like other stuff. So you can do the rope and the skateboard? Or maybe you can do the rope while you're skateboarding? I tried it once, but... <laughs> <laughs> he tried it once. It didn't work, did it? <laughs> you gotta stick, see you gotta stick with it the old fashioned way, the way it's been done for generations. Is this the way you start them off? Yes, this is the way you start them off. You try to get them used to the horse, um, having them to enjoy it, uh, bringing them over to these uh, functions so they can start enjoying the, the charreada and be part of it and love it as a part of our heritage. It really is a part of the heritage, it is. isn't it? It is. From our parents, our grandparents. Uh, my grandfather was a president of the Charros uh, in Jalisco and Chiquilislan. I was uh, uh, a charra also in Jalisco, Guadalajara. Well, now I haven't seen any women out there today. Do they have women? We do. They have. Charros? They have the women charras. Um, just depending on uh, when the associations, each group has their functions and uh, their queens, they come out and ride their horses as a festival thing. This is the day of El Charro, which all the men basically come and compete and show but when they have a separate function the charras do come out and do so we have a potential up here we have two we have two a charro and a charra to be is this part of family life in a lot of the rural parts of, of Mexico and now California? It is. A lot of the uh, small towns, even bigger towns where you uh, are raised in uh, ranches and small towns, you start enjoying it. And in festivals, whether it's the uh, 15th, 16th of September, the fiestas, um, any type of carnivals that they have, they do celebrate this and the children get very much involved. They love it, their parents, and it becomes part of us. Do you think this is going to become a California tradition the same way it, for the last 200 years, has been a Mexican tradition? Well, we don't think it's already over here in California and it's getting stronger and stronger. So the hopes and the efforts we put in as a community is to keep whatever we want to leave, if we want uh, any country, our tradition will with us. <laughs> Well, the benefit of this is no, no benefits of money-wise. It's uh, recognizing anywhere you go as a charro, you are one of the best. Well, that's our program about three of our state's traditions. 
And to be completely honest with you, when we started doing research on this whole subject, we quickly discovered that our state has so many traditions that we've already decided to do future programs on the same subject. There's enough material on traditions to last a long time. Well, as we close our program, as always, I'd like to thank all of you for watching. And most importantly, I'd like to invite you to tune in again next time. Come on along with us as we continue our search for California's goal. out behind the stands now and what are you doing out here? I'm just a spectator today. We usually ride but uh, it's invitation only today so a couple of guys from our team are invited and we're here to support them. Yeah, yeah, but I'm talking about what I just saw you doing oh, here. just walking by, decided to rope a post. <laughs> He's roping a post. Could you rope the post for us? Sure. I want to see this. Of course the post is not moving. If you can't rope that post, we're in trouble. Here he goes. <laughs> All right. <laughs> you do that well with a horse? Yeah, I'm horse too. <laughs> well, hello, everybody. I'm Huell Hauser, and I sure hope you enjoyed this adventure. If you'd like to see it again or share it with your family or friends, or perhaps donate a copy to your local school or library, it's available on video cassette and on DVD. All you have to do is call one 800 2665727 and we'll be glad to send it to you right away.